In the last video, we looked at two examples of complex functions, one of which was holomorphic, while the other wasn't holomorphic. By holomorphic, I mean it was differentiable. For these examples, z cubed was holomorphic or differentiable everywhere, while 2y plus xi wasn't holomorphic anywhere. So how is it that a function with these real and imaginary parts was holomorphic, but a function with these real and imaginary parts wasn't holomorphic? It's because for a complex function to be holomorphic, we need some special relationships between its real and imaginary parts to be satisfied. So even though 2y and x are each continuous and differentiable in real space, the fact that they don't satisfy these special relationships as real and imaginary parts makes the complex function overall non-holomorphic. The relationships between the real and imaginary parts of a complex function that need to be satisfied for it to be holomorphic are called the cauchy raymond relations. In fact, there's two theorems that attest to this. The first theorem just says that if I have a holomorphic complex function, something like this, then its real and imaginary parts satisfy du by dx equals dv by dy. And the second relationship is that du by dy equals negative dv by dx. And these relationships are satisfied in the region R, where the complex function is holomorphic. These two equations or relationships are called the cauchy raymond relations. All this first theorem says is that the cauchy raymond relations are necessary conditions for holomorphicity. It doesn't say anything about them being sufficient. In other words, if a function doesn't obey the cauchy raymond relations, then it can't be holomorphic. The second theorem, however, does talk about sufficient conditions. This guy states that if the following conditions are met in a region R of the complex plane, the first is that the partial derivatives of u and v with respect to x and y exist. The second is that they're continuous. And the third is that they satisfy the cauchy raymond relations. If all these three conditions are met, then the function f of z, which is composed of the real part u and the imaginary part v, that function is holomorphic in the region R. I won't be proving any of these two theorems unless everyone gets pissed at me, in which case I will make a video. But in the context of a mathematical physics lecture series, I think stating these theorems should suffice. Now that we know about the cauchy raymond relations, we can go back to our two examples and verify, using cauchy raymond why one is holomorphic and the other isn't. So if I copy this from up here, there we go. So let's verify that z cubed is holomorphic using the second theorem. Well, the real and imaginary parts u and v are both polynomials, so clearly their partial derivatives must exist and must be continuous, so that's not a problem. But are the cauchy raymond relations satisfied? Let's check. The partial derivative of u with respect to x is just uh, bring the power down and then reduce it by 1, 3x squared minus 3y squared. Because remember, y is just a constant when we're taking the partial derivative with respect to x. The partial derivative of v with respect to y is also 3x squared minus 3y squared. And now x is constant in this case. If we go back to the cauchy raymond relations, we know that du dx must equal dv dy. And in this case, that's true. So the first relation works. Let's check the second relation. Partial u partial y is just negative 6xy, while partial v partial x is just 6xy. From the cauchy raymond relations, these guys have to be negatives of each other, and in this case that's true. So we verified, using the second theorem, that z cubed is indeed a holomorphic function. Now let's verify that the second example, 2y plus xi, is not holomorphic. Again, 2y and x are both continuous and have continuous derivatives, so that's not an issue, which means all we have left is to check the cauchy raymond relations. Here, du dx is 0, because there's no x in this term. And dv dy is also 0, because there's no y in this term. Since these two have to be equal, we've actually verified that the first cauchy raymond relation holds. However, du dy is just 2, and the partial v partial x is just 1. Since these two have to be negatives of each other, the second cauchy raymond relation isn't satisfied. Because of this, and because of the fact that from the first theorem, 
the cauchy raymond relations have to be satisfied for a function to be holomorphic, we can conclude that 2y plus xi is not holomorphic, which is exactly what we found in the last video, albeit with a different approach. There is a couple of more theorems left, none of which I'll prove, sadly, before I end this video. One of these theorems is a really powerful one. What it states is that if I have a complex function that's holomorphic or differentiable in a region R on the complex plane, then that function is infinitely differentiable in the region R. So if the first derivative of my complex function exists and it's continuous, then it follows that derivatives of all orders of that function exist and are continuous. That's really powerful stuff. Another theorem has to do with Taylor series expansions of complex functions. So again, if I have a function that's holomorphic in R, then I can write that function as a Taylor series around any point in R. This is because if it's holomorphic, then I know from the previous theorem that it's infinitely differentiable, which is why I can write a Taylor series for it. Because remember, when you want to write a Taylor series for a function of a single variable, you need that function to be infinitely differentiable about the point where you're expanding. And this is what this theorem makes use of. The radius of convergence of that Taylor series or power series will be the distance between z0, which is the point you're expanding about, and the singular point that's closest to z0, which is why I have a minimum in this expression. By singular point, what I mean is a point where f of z is not complex differentiable. It's not holomorphic. Its derivative isn't defined. So let's illustrate this idea of radius of convergence of a Taylor series of a complex function. Say I have a complex function 1 over z. We can clearly see that f is going to be undefined at z equals 0. So although I can't make a Taylor series expansion around z equals 0, I might be able to make one at, say, z equals 1. What this theorem says is that when I make a Taylor expansion of 1 over z about z equals 1, then the region in which my Taylor expansion works is a circle centered at z equals 1 with a radius of 1. Note that because complex numbers exist on a plane, the region of convergence is now a circle instead of a mere interval, because remember in real functions you had an interval of convergence, but for complex functions you have a region of convergence, because complex numbers are effectively two-dimensional numbers. I'm going to state one last theorem before ending this video. This theorem states that if I have a holomorphic function f, then its real and imaginary parts both satisfy Laplace's equation in the region where f is holomorphic. It's actually very easy, dare I say trivial, to prove this just by differentiating the cauchy raymond relations and doing a little bit of algebra. So because they satisfy Laplace's equation, the real and imaginary parts of a complex function, u and v, are considered harmonic functions. In fact, any function that satisfies Laplace's equation in a nice enough region can possibly be the real or imaginary part of a holomorphic complex function. Anyway, that does it for this video. Uh, but before I go, let me apologize for the fact that for most of this video, I chucked a whole bunch of theorems at you without really proving anything. If theorems intimidate you, then I'm sorry, but for me, it's kind of unavoidable to use them when teaching complex variables. But I promise that after I'm done introducing the basic concepts, I'll do my best to go over some applications and problems. Thanks for watching.